another night in the factory doing the midnight chef. Um, so good evening, good evening, good evening. I'm live, and um, interestingly enough, you know, so we're a jacket tonight for live. One of my fans called me earlier today, telling me, "Oh." What time are you coming on live tonight? So I said I'd come on live at 11. And um, the particular fan is um, the grandson of the president of a country. So that's who the grandson is. Uh, grandson of a president of a country who is a lawyer, so I thought I'd dress up for him since he messaged me to tell me he's a fan, so interesting things to talk about tonight I like the fact that the Human Rights Tribunal awarded a migrant worker Adrian Montrose from St. Lucia uh, who was here on the uh, seasonal agricultural workers program he was awarded twenty three thousand dollars in damages because of racial abuse that he suffered while working at the greenhouse in Leamington Ontario and Mr. Montrose wasn't a kid that was suffered that was subjected to racial abuse he was a 25 year old man at the time and he was being called monkeys and all kind of other racial slurs by his supervisor. And of course, other workers were being called uh, racial uh, derogatory names, but uh, they all uh, did not complain because of um, uh, fear of losing their jobs. And that fear was well-founded because as soon as Adrian Montrose objected to the racial slurs that was being used by a supervisor, he was fired. Oh, somebody tells me they can't hear me well. So I had a I had a fan on, so I turned it off. So hopefully, hopefully my um, hopefully you can hear better now so I was talking about the Adrian Montrose case and the $23,000 award that he received because of uh, racial slurs that he experienced at the um, at the farm where he was working at in Leamington Ontario and um, he um, he complained to the Human Rights Tribunal but interestingly enough about uh, Adrian's case is this migrant worker was fired as soon as he objected to the racial slurs. So he was awarded $23,500 in damages. Um, it's too bad um, his um, lawyer probably didn't seek reinstatement. It would have been good if they could have slammed that employer, um, the Double Diamond Acres Limited, slammed them harder. Um, because that's the only way employers seem to um, to be able to um, understand racism and deal with it in a way that restores people's dignity when you hit them in the pocket and when you hit them hard in the pocket. So, um, but twenty-three thousand dollars is a good start in terms of um, of uh, damages um, for you know, calling him monkey and subject him, subjecting him to other abuse. Certainly, um, he was awarded 5000 for lost wages, 3000 for uh, damages to his dignity, and the most damages came in the form of $18,000 uh, for the reprisal, which would have been the termination of his employment because he complained. So that's that's a good start. Um, that's a that's a good start. Eighteen 
it seems like and people talk about people talk about a society now where you know race is not an issue but that was one issue in the news today another issue is um the um, involving monkey again R rcmp ex-military members um claim systemic racism in a lawsuit and um one of them was called a poach monkey his wife was threatened with bananas um or pelted with bananas he was threatened to be burnt and these are three three um uh black uh, military officials one of them while his father 43 years 43 years old from nova scotia and then there's jean pierre robotai from um from New Brunswick who is from Haitian um, descent and obviously these men complained that because of the racist behavior that they experienced um, they suffered isolation post-traumatic stress disorder and was forced to terminate their employment in the military um, early you know um, you have um, this one officer said that his stepchildren were spat and subject to drive-by verbal assaults, put off the school bus, denied lunch in the cafeteria. His spouse had bananas thrown at her while walking home on the base, and members often refused to be served by her at the shop where she worked. This is Canada, and somebody wrote me today. Somebody wrote me today, um, my friend who is an attorney in the U.S., um, Brian Ben. He wrote me today um, telling me that um, Canada is the, um, the bastion of democratic freedoms. Right? That's what, that's what Brian wrote me telling me, that Canada is a bastion of uh, democratic freedoms. So... Um, I responded to him. So this is because Canada recently um, signed an agreement uh, with the National Assembly in Guyana to provide um, to provide training to its parliamentarian. And this paper said that. Um, the newspaper article that reported this says Canada is known for being a model democratic is as being is known for being the most democratic country in the entire world. And my response was mother democratic country my foot. And really mother democratic my foot. I could use another part of my body but I'm gonna be decent because if you have Aboriginal people living in in conditions uh that are the are worse than conditions that people live in in third world countries you have uh places in canada where people can't even uh get fresh fruits and fresh vegetables at um a reasonable rate you have you walk it's the winter now and you have people sleeping on the streets you you're on the subway and you see these these homeless people um the the dirty luggage and the smell simply because they can't take care of themselves and the state has no interest in taking care of them what you telling me but canada is uh the most uh democratic country in the world and it's a model give me a break it's not it's not our parliament passes our parliament passes law that is systemically racist and is responsible like blacks and aboriginals are the highest population uh per per capita the highest population when you measure their numbers in federal penitentiaries and that's because of our system our system, the laws that are passed that are systemically racist towards these uh, groups and how they're um, enforced by the police, um, how they're prosecuted by prosecutors 
and judges. Judges that simply um, couldn't care less because these people don't look like them. And I say that because I practice in those courts. And so I know. I know. I don't even want to go to those courts anymore because I'm, I'm sick of it. I'm really sick of it. So I'm not, I'm not too, um, I'm not, I'm not too thrilled to appear in those systems that are systemically racist towards black people. And, and where does it stem from? The Law Society of Upper Canada, the Law Society of Upper Canada is the bastion of racism and not me saying that. Their own benchers, their own governors that run that place um, speak out about how they're a cesspool of racism. A cesspool of racism. Um, you know, um, they brought a report called Challenges Faced by Racialized Minorities in the Legal Profession. And um, it was so it was so paternalistic, it was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. So I hope I hope they um I hope they um they tune into this tomorrow, which no doubt they will. But um you know this is what Rocco Galati on the bencher said. Um he said this in terms of their, their report. He said when I hear the word diversity kicked around in this place, which is the Law Society, I don't actually compute the words digest or regurgitate the substantive notion. What I really hear in code is not diversity, but diversion. Diversion of issues, diversion of reality, diversion of actions, and that's what these recommendations are. They're yet another diversion of actions. The nebulous gibberish that will have an impact akin to a mosquito breaking wind in my view. That's what their bencher said about that racist bastion across the street from where I work, the Lost Society of Upper Canada. And I can call them that because I know them. I know them. And they can't come to me and say, oh, Selvin, you don't follow the rules on this and that, so you better shut up because we're going to go after you. I follow all the rules so I can speak with more authority and criticize them without fear and them running up in my office trying to intimidate me. And then this is what he said further. He said, because 2016, we can't come up with recommendations with teeth with actual enforcement of making sure that the legal profession, and listen to this, does not continue to be racist. I don't use the word discrimination with respect to racial discrimination because that's another whitewash euphemism. euphemism. And that's Rocco Galati who's won their benchers. If you discriminate on race, you're racist. The only question is degree. And that's the end of quote uh, for Rocco. Right? That's the end of the quote for that one. Rocco went on to say, the law society... And it's true, if you look at the racial mix of who run it, the bureaucracy, we might well be in Pretoria, South Africa. This is what Rocco Galati, one of their benchers, is telling them on December 2nd of 2016. This is not something I'm reading from like 15 years ago. This is a month ago. Why don't we start with cleaning up our own act right here in this building? There is no diversity in the bureaucracy that runs this place. And we should have done that before these recommendations came forward and lecture other firms on how to voluntarily take meaningful, meaningless oaths and hopefully voluntarily comply. Here, here, Rocco. T tell them as it is. So Rocco was right. And I love Rocco Galati for that because he tells them, he tells them as it is. He called them racist. I don't have to call them that. I just got to read from what their own venture said, that they're a, a racist bastion over there akin to Pretoria, South Africa. I ain't said that. That's what their own venture said. And I love it because I can quote it. 
I can quote it that it's true. They fired the they fired the senior manager named Arlene Spence. And before they fired her, they used her to, to persecute other black employees that was below her. So they ended up firing four black employees in a short period of time. And it, and it was and that campaign was led by their own executive director. Shame. Shame on them. Shame on them. And then we call in Canada Mother. Can they know that model? Can they can this as bad as other places or worse? Except except that their their racism most of the time it comes with, with a silly smile. It comes with a silly smile that I got so accustomed to that I give them back the same stupid smile that has become so meaningless to me my smile for the most part you could know when it's genuine and it's fake and i got it from them joan st louis another bencher um spoke spoke about um, the Law Society's um, uh, recommendations and their, their challenges report. And um, she was also, she was also critical, she was also critical of the, the report and I don't blame her. And she was as, um, she was as harsh as Rocco Galati again. You know, and I'm going to find a relevant passage from her um, where she spoke about it. But she spoke about, she spoke about the challenges faced by law students and black lawyers and so on. And she says this, she says, I've been a professor since 1989. I have students every single year, especially as the labor market gets more and more difficult, talking to me about sanitizing their resume in every way possible so that there is not an ability to identify these vulnerabilities. So as much as we're celebrating that we're talking about racialization, I have students who are Métis, I have students who are Black, but people who maybe they can pass from Middle Eastern. I got students from the Middle East who are saying, I am worried about Islamophobia. So they go out of their way to sometimes create a resume for certain forms, regardless of your approach and openness that they anticipate as a threat. So a lot of people are sanitizing their names, sanitizing their job experiences, and etc., etc., because when there's a paper review of their resume, they don't want to um, they don't want to uh, be rejected simply because of their ethnicity or their religious origin and so So she spoke out about that and she spoke out about a lot of other things. There are other people that spoke, Julian Faulkner spoke. Um, I'm not going to read what he has to say because um, his own did not resonate as much as other people and um, for other reasons, but um, there are other people that spoke, but there's no doubt that a lot of hard work, uh, as Potter, Miss Potter said, she says, there's no doubt that a great deal of hard work and passion, enthusiasm, blood, sweat, and tears went into this report on the parts of many individuals. That may well be the case, but if you create some report that's a sham, that's a whitewash, as Rocco Galati called it, that doesn't call racism for what it is and that doesn't speak about the racist culture and the society is, is the racist culture that infects itself to lawyer in itself and the judiciary 
because you have to pass through the law society to become a lawyer and all the judges and the lawyers and the paralegals now are connected to the law society. So of course they take their cue from that law society which um, finds itself in a position, as his bencher said, no different from Pretoria, South Africa. A lot of black lawyers are sole practitioners, and they're sole practitioners not because they want to be sole practitioners. They're sole practitioners because they're not being hired in the firms for which they have the experience. A lot of lawyers want to. A lot of black lawyers want to practice corporate commercial law. They want to practice securities and all those kind of law. And they can't get into the firms that would give them a job. They can, yes, they can't. They can't. Um, they can't get jobs with these firms. Even at the law society, that racist bastion. How many blacks it has in a senior hierarchy? Silch. Silch. And, and that's the only reason when I show up with my student, when I show up with my student, they could excessively scrutinize me and, and, and try to deny me entry through that door. Right? That's the only reason that they can do that. They can they can try to deny me access because they can try to de deny me access because that's the culture of that place. The culture of that place is not welcoming to people who have black skin. Don't let them don't let them try to fool you. That that's that's the way they are. I mean, I mean, there's a test for Trudeau now. There's a big test for Trudeau right now because there's 17 vacancies. There's 17 vacancies on the judiciary, um, right? Including four vacancies. Yep, including um, four vacancies on the Court of Appeal in Toronto and 12 vacancies for the Court of Appeal. So um, there's all kind of vacancies on the, um, on the Court of Appeal and the Superior Court. And we'll have to see, we'll have to see how many judges or how many of the persons who were appointed out of all those vacancies that exist are black, are Aboriginal, are South Asian, or make up the multicultural mosaic of this society or whether, whether the appointment um, to the judiciary is going to continue to be a whitewash. And regardless of how those judges feel, most of them, most of them, they give you the, the smile and they give you the audience. But most of them are not sensitive to the needs of black people because that's not, that's not their social realm. And I know that because, hey, for the last eight years I've been in a, I've been in the chambers with four to five other lawyers, and so far, without change, I've consistently been the only black lawyer here, and, and I can look at the various interactions, and I'm not saying that it's racist or anything. I want to be um, 
taking out of context, but you can see and you can understand people that aren't, some people that aren't accustomed to interacting with black people and how they treat you. I've, had, I've got lawyers in these chambers where I work and they see me every single day and they don't even say morning or good afternoon. Or I say morning or good afternoon and it's like I'm speaking to the wind. Or, or they, or they, one, one woman said to me, um, oh, she says, she said, do judges really listen to you with that dreadlocks or that singing you hear? And I was like, excuse me? <laughs> I was like, excuse me? And this is a lawyer who won an international award asking me that crap. So one day she locked herself out. One day she locked herself out of the chamber. She didn't have her, her pass card. And she's knocking on the door. I just walked past her. I just walked past her and let her go right back down to security and let them let her in. I said, if this woman has contempt for black people and she has no respect for black people, why the hell am I doing anything for her that, that I don't necessarily have to do? So I, I let her stand out there, teach her a lesson. That you know, you you want to be like that. Don't think I'm gonna. Don't think I'm gonna be nice and smile with you and 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 be nice to you. I, I can give right back as I get. You know, that's my life. I'm not gonna sit on my deathbed and feel sorry for myself when I'm dying because I didn't deal with certain people in the way that they deserve to deal with. My heaven and hell is on earth, and I'm gonna deal with you accordingly to your own just desserts. That's how. I see it. You get dealt with according to your just desserts. I mean, it's the same thing with Islamophobia. Every single day, every single day, I get tons and tons of phone calls. About about people who are being mistreated, mostly schools now, and it's hard to find lawyers. It's hard to find lawyers to deal with these situations because most of the situations I can't deal with. I can't deal with most of them. Otherwise, I'm working twenty four seven. Even though. <laughs> I am working 24-7 already. It's like 11.30. 11.30 and I'm on my live in my office. So I, I'm, I'm really pumping out those hours already. But, you know, um, one has to one has to say things as it is. You know, there are all these judicial appointments that are coming up. I'm going to put my application in for a judge. Regardless of whether I get appointed or not, I'm putting that application in and going through that process. Since I'm qualified, you gotta you gotta serve ten years or more to even put an application in. And so I've served ten years or more unblemished. And that's a genuine smile on my face. Unblemished. I've got no court judgment against me, I've got no cost awards against me, I've got no law society findings against me, I've got nothing, no trusteeship, no bankruptcy, nothing. I've survived in this environment and run a profitable law firm without any uh, ethical issues or legal problems. So I'm thankful for that. So I'm going to put my application in for a judge. It seems like an onerous process, but um, I will go through that. And there are lots of tribunal appointments that are coming up. Um, the government has like a whole bunch of quasi-judicial appointments that are coming up. So um, I'm going to apply for, put my name in the hat for that too, whether or not I get appointed. I'm going through, I'm going to go through these processes to, to see whether these processes, as they say, are based on meritocracy or whether, whether, whether they're just a smokescreen. 
a, a smoke screen for uh, uh, basically appointing well not appointment but jobs for the boys job for the boys job for their friends jobs for people who supported a particular political party or or you know curry favor to certain uh, cabinet ministers or members of parliament so we'll see I will I will go through those processes to test the integrity of these systems you know and we can call these systems over what it is you, you you can see the systems at work every day and, and see the problems uh, uh, with these with these systems I mean some guy just wrote me telling me that he was um, yeah there was a case recently that I read about too that shows you how horrible the system is it stinks some guy was locked up for 10 years some guy was jailed for 10 years for a crime he didn't commit and after he um, after he was exonerated he sued and the judge said well you don't have a claim against the police you don't have Caleb McCollum uh, was the judge who rendered the judgment and he says oh you don't have a claim against the police Uh, you should have, um, you know, we don't know whether you applied for bail. We don't know whether you did this. We don't know whether you did that. And the other, the fact of the matter remains is that a man was in jail for close to 10 years for a crime that he, he didn't commit. Right? He should have been, he should have been entitled to, um, he should have been entitled to um, some form of, of compensation you know you say you say well you know it's none of my concern well it should be your concern it should be your concern and that case is called Farley versus Ottawa Police Services Board uh, 2016 ONSC 717 uh, that's the case where the man where the man George Farley spent 10 years, 10 years in prison. And after he was exonerated, he sued for negligence, malicious prosecution, and charity damages. And, um, and Kayla McCollum was pretty, pretty um, unsympathetic to the man, granting judgment in favor of the defendant dismissing the action. And he says, well, you know, it's not only the police are that are at fault, at, not only the police um, that are in the mix here, but um, that um, there were other players in the criminal justice system, uh, you know, that could have, um, uh, could have um, been part of what this man's experience was but you know the man should have gotten some form of compensation you know um, and sometimes you have to you have to call these things out call them as it is because um, a lot of people are fearful to um, speak about these these very controversial issues because they fear paying a high price you can pay a high price anyway, because if you if you you know if you internalize these things, your your mental health, your emotional health, your own quality of life and well-being suffers. And so it better you call it out. It better you say it as it is, you know. Anyway, um, I've been on for thirty minutes. I think that's good enough for the night. Um, thanks for those who tuned in and good night.